future to address specific issues and concerns raised in today's hearings. Now, let me be, be clear. There is a need for more certainty and clarity of the reach of the Clean Water Act. However, this rule will provide neither. After today's hearing, I hope the administration will take action by pulling the proposed rule and start over by working with the states and taking into consideration the concerns that they have heard from the stakeholders. Or if the EPA and CORE proceed, push this rule through, I call on the administration to repropose the rule for a new round of public comment. This will allow the states and the stakeholders a chance to see the significant changes EPA and the core claim they have made since the first comment period closed. Now, I thank the witnesses for taking their time to be here today, which will be uh, spread over two panels of testimony. And I look forward to the hearing from everyone here today, and, and I'm pleased to yield to the ranking member of the subcommittee, Representative Rujan Grisham, for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and as you can see, clearly my legs aren't nearly as long as the chairman, so it took me longer uh, to get to the committee from vote, so I apologize. I'll get a scooter and see if I can't get here uh, more timely. Steps. Will you take that? that? That seems like a great compromise. I appreciate that, and I'm really excited, Mr. Chairman, about having this uh, first hearing uh, in this subcommittee of uh, this Congress, and I'm really honored to be uh, the ranking member, and I appreciate your leadership. and holding this committee, and I'm very grateful to have the panel here, and particularly I'm going to give a shout out to a fellow New Mexican, Jeff Witte, who is the uh, uh, Secretary of our Department of Agriculture. He and I have worked in state government since the mid-90s, I think. I think actually I was there before you, so I'm your elder. Uh, and I'm really honored that he's here. He's uh, someone who has great respect in New Mexico. I know the other panelists uh, in their own rights are going to give us great testimony. But I want to thank you for your expertise, Jeff. I want to thank you for making the trip. And I appreciate the work that you're doing uh, on behalf of uh, our agricultural community and all New Mexicans. So thank you very much. Today's hearing, uh, we're going to discuss the pending rule to define waters of the United States. Now, as a representative from a state that is currently in a historic drought, projected to become now a mega drought over the next several decades, I understand uh, more than ever the importance of protecting this scarce resource. It's essential for farmers, ranchers, municipalities, consumers, fish and wildlife. Now, policymakers have an obligation to work together to ensure that communities have access to safe drinking water, agricultural producers have adequate water resources, and local economies are not adversely affected by vague and unclear policies and regulations. EPA has stated that the rule is supposed to provide greater clarity on what types of waters are covered under the Clean Water Act, including intermittent and ephemeral rivers. I appreciate the importance of protecting these types of tributaries. 95% uh, of New Mexico's linear streams are actually considered intermittent, and over 280,000 people in New Mexico receive drinking water from public drinking water systems that at least in part rely on these types of streams and rivers. Now, although I, too, agree with the EPA's intent, as stated by the chairman, uh, that they have an obligation, and I have an expectation that they fulfill that obligation, to protect clean water, a one-size-fits-all approach can often lead to unintended consequences. Today's hearing will give us the opportunity to identify those unintended consequences and look for areas for improvement and common ground, how we can move forward. I've heard concerns from many stakeholders about how the pending rule could impact their way of living, their ability to regulate and protect clean water, and their efforts to spur economic development. These stakeholders agree that the rule must provide more clarity regarding de uh, definitions and jurisdictional issues. I hope our witnesses will be able to provide some specific examples of their concerns and better yet, constructive suggestions for areas of improvement. In closing, uh, I again want to welcome today's witnesses, including Secretary Witte, and I also look forward to everyone's testimony. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity, and I yield back. Uh, thank the general lady. Now, please recognize uh, the full Agriculture Committee Chairman, Chairman Conway, for an opening statement. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, ask unanimous consent to uh, submit my opening statement for the record. But I would like to uh, would like to brag on you and the ranking member. I've got great confidence in uh, in you both. Uh, this is a terrific topic. 
a timely topic for you to have your very first subcommittee hearing under the 114th Congress, and uh, you're off, going to be off to a great start. You've got a good panel of uh, witnesses here today, and I want to thank all of you for the trek that you made to come to D.C. to share with us your wisdom with, uh, about these uh, these issues. And so looking forward to uh, GT, your leadership, and Michelle, your assistance on this uh, uh, this and other issues to follow under the Conservation and Forestry uh, subcommittee. And the, and the members on both sides of the aisle are here because you want to be on this subcommittee, and, uh, and that's a real uh, uh, it should be heartening to those who are affected by the, uh, uh, by the jurisdiction of the subcommittee. So thank you all for the great work that you're about to do. And uh, with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Chairman. The Chair would request that other members submit their opening statements for the record so that the witnesses may begin their testimony and to ensure that there is ample time for questions. The Chair would also like to remind members that they will be recognized for questioning in order of seniority for members who were present at the start of the hearing. After that, members will be recognized in order of their arrival. Certainly appreciate the members' understanding. Witnesses are reminded to uh, limit their oral presentations to five minutes. Uh, all written statements uh, will be included in the record. Um, and uh, just call your attention to the light system we have. Uh, uh, you have five minutes when it's green. You have one minute remaining that's yellow. And when we get to the red, uh, we just ask you to finish whatever um, line of thought that you are currently on. Uh, we have uh, two panels today uh, full of great witnesses, and I assure you the, the written testimony has been distributed ahead of time. Uh, we really appreciate the effort that went into, um, I, th I thought the testimony, the, your written testimony was uh, well done and very thorough, um, and we are expecting a uh, vote series later this afternoon, so we're going to try to stay on track with, uh, with the five minutes. So I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the table. As the ranking member has already noted, we're pleased to have the Honorable Jeff M. Uh, Witte, uh, Director, Secretary, New Mexico Department of Agriculture, on behalf of the National Association of Departments of Agriculture from Las Cruz, New Mexico. Uh, we have the Honorable Robert Pete Smeltz, uh, Clinton County Commissioner, on behalf of the National Association of Counties from McElhattan, Pennsylvania. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Joseph S. Fox, State Forester, Arkansas Forestry Commission on behalf of the National Association of State Foresters, Little Rock, Arkansas, and the Honorable Martha Clark Mettler, Deputy Assistant Commissioner of the Office of Water Quality, Indiana Department of Environmental Management on behalf of the Association of Clean Water Administrators from Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, with that, uh, Secretary Woody, please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Luhan Grisham. Thank you for those kind opening remarks. And members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to join you this afternoon. It's truly an honor to be here. My name is Jeff Whitty, and I'm here to represent the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture. I sit before you today to express my concerns with the significant negative impacts of the proposed Waters of the U.S. rule on farmers, ranchers, and people in other agricultural industries. The stated intent of the proposed rule was to increase clarity and consistency, but in fact it has done the opposite, creating confusion and uncertainty for agricultural producers, rural communities, and state governments. New Mexico is an arid state with diverse landscapes, and overall we get much less precipitation than other states. This means irrigated farms are reliant upon ditches fed by spring runoff, which only flow ephemerally. Ephemer <laughs> you know. <laughs> The proposed definition of ditches has, has been a point of confusion since the rule's publication. <clears throat> it is unclear if many ditches that feed into the rivers will be considered tributaries under Section S5 or will be excluded as ditches under Section T3 or T4. Ranchers are also dependent on catching rainwater for livestock and, control, and to control erosion, which may now be regulated under this rule. In the Southwest, we are especially concerned about jurisdiction over erosional features such as arroyos. It is unclear from the rule if arroyos will be jurisdictional as small tributaries under Section S5 or ex excluded because of their status as an erosional feature as gullies are in Section T57. This proposed rule leaves other important terms undefined. One such term, prior converted cropland, causes concern in the agricultural community. Across the nation, agricultural producers and regulators have expressed that they are unclear how the term prior converted cropland will be applied in the, under the Clean Water Act. The rule exempts prior converted cropland from jurisdiction but fails to define the term and fails to adopt any other agency's existing definition. The changes in the Clean Water Act are not just an issue in the arid west. Florida Commissioner Adam Putnam recently testified about the rule before a joint committee. 
He worried the, proposed, the proposal would assert jurisdiction over isolated wetlands located miles away from navigable waters. Another example is in Iowa where they have to drain their fields using a tile drainage system. The century-old system will have to be updated by in the coming decades. My colleagues in Iowa estimate that the wetland mitigation associated with this upgrade would cost $1.8 billion without the rule, and under the proposed rule, they estimate the <coughs> expenditures could theoretically balloon to more than $57 billion over a 30 to 50 year period. My team has worked with our state environment permitting, environmental permitting agency, the Soil and Water Conservation Districts, and others. We have concluded that this rulemaking represents a federal overreach into state affairs, specifically states' authority to manage water. States have been provided with the authority to manage water quality under the Clean Water Act. The New Mexico Environment Department stated in their comments that they are most significantly concerned that the proposed rules definition of tributary will unconstitutionally increase federal authority over the traditionally held intrastate intermittent and ephemeral waters. <clears throat> These concerns, which are not which have not yet been addressed, make managing water quality at the state level burdensome. In addition, the industries that support our nation's food system and public health would be affected by this rule. Pesticide labels, which carry important information about application and use, will change due to the expanded jurisdictional areas where they are prohibited. Pesticides are not used only for crops, they are also used for multiple other ways, such as vector control to mitigate infectious diseases and algae control to reduce harmful toxins in drinking water. Therefore, the expanded jurisdiction of this, this rule calls for could negatively impact public health by reducing the regulator's ability to use these tools effectively. Conservation efforts could also be affected by the changes in, resulting from the uncertainty in the rule. For example, in 2005, the BLM began the Restore New Mexico initiative. This program brings together federal, state, local soil and water conservation districts and private partners, including farmers and ranchers, to restore landscapes across the state. These partners have restored more than 3 million acres by thinning overgrown forest, <coughs> restoring native grasses, removing non-native plants, and reclaiming abandoned oil fields. Over the past 10 years, at least $100 million, 40% from private partners, has been used for on-the-ground conservation programs. We have identified another 4 million acres in the state for, for restoration work. This rule puts that work in jeopardy. Increases, the time, increases in time and money required for permitting would, be, would divert resources away from conservation projects. The average age of the agricultural producer in the U.S. is 58. Unclear regulations and burdens could dampen innovation and prevent younger generations from joining the farm family business. Without the opportunity for these young agriculturals to succeed, our reliable and superior food supply could be undermined. EPA has stated that we, we can expect extensive revisions in the final rule. While we hope for extensive revisions, we are concerned that those revisions may not catch all of the issues that have caused individuals, organizations, local and state governments to submit over one million comments on this rule. In addition, EPA and the Army Corps have not posted all the comments or responded to them, yet agencies have indicated their intent to finalize the rule in the near future. My request to the committee is that you support and encourage the complete withdrawal of this rule late this year in the Cromnibus of 2014, late last year in the Cromnibus of 2014, Congress- Mr. Mr. Secretary, if you could um, oh, go ahead and- I'll wrap it up, pleasure. sorry. Thank you. Uh, so it, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be before the, the committee today and uh, be happy to answer any questions. I will look forward to that exchange, give you a chance to uh, maybe address some of those last points. Commissioner Smells, once again, uh, it's uh, good to have somebody from home here. Uh, welcome, and go ahead and proceed with your five minutes of testimony, please. Yes, uh, it's good to be here, and thank you, Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Grisham and members of the subcommittee. <coughs> Mr. Commissioner, you want to just suspend for a second? We'll see about... Plan B. Go ahead, sir. You can go ahead and start from the beginning. Okay. How's that? Okay, very good. Again, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Thompson, and thanking and ranking member Grisham for the opportunity to testify today before you and members of the subcommittee as well, for the opportunity to testify on how the proposed waters of the U.S. rule could impact rural America. 
My name is Pete Smeltz. I am an elected county commissioner from Clinton County, Pennsylvania, and today I am representing the National Association of Counties. As a county commissioner, I interact with constituents and local businesses every day. Prior to my election as a county commissioner, I spent 35 years with the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, managing over 300 road miles in their drainage systems. Clinton County, Pennsylvania is considered rural, with a population of just under 40,000 residents. The vast majority of our county is made up of forest and some farmland. Our state and local governments have a long history of protecting our water resources. Across Pennsylvania, I have heard concerns about how we could be affected by the proposed rule, and these concerns have been echoed by counties of all sizes across the country. NACO has worked closely with technical experts, including county engineers, legal staff, public works directors, and stormwater managers, and ultimately called for the proposed rule to be withdrawn until further analysis and consultation with local officials is completed. This decision was not taken lightly, and we worked very hard to, to both ensure public safety while protecting water quality. Counties in Pennsylvania and across the country accomplished these goals by working with conservation districts, zoning, pa zoning, passing ordinances, and regulating stormwater runoff and illegal discharges. I'm here today to share with you the four main reasons we decided to call for the withdrawal of the proposed rule. First, this issue is so important because counties build, own, and maintain a significant portion of public safety infrastructure, and the proposed rule would have a direct and extensive implications. Local governments own almost 80% of all the public road miles and so own and maintain and maintaining roadside ditches. They are responsible flood, for flood control channels, stormwater systems, and culverts. In Pennsylvania, counties own over 4,000 bridges which require construction and maintenance projects. Because we own so much infrastructure and are responsible for public safety, defining which waters and conveyances fall under federal juris jurisdiction has a direct impact on counties. Second, the agencies developing the proposed rule did not sufficiently consult with local governments. Counties are not just stakeholders in this discussion, we are partners in our nation's intergovernmental system. By federal law, by law, federal agencies are required to consult with their state and local partners before a rule is published and throughout its development. However, this process was not completed by the agencies. This leads to my third point. Due to this inadequate consultation, many terms in the, in the proposed rule are vague and create uncertainty and confusion at the local level. For example, the proposed rules introduces new definitions of tributary, significant nexus, adjacency, riparian areas, and floodplains. Depending on how these terms are interpreted, additional public infrastructure could fall under federal jurisdiction. The proposed rule, as currently written, only adds to the confusion and uncertainty over how this would be implemented consistently across all regions. Our fourth and final reason for calling for the withdrawal is that the current, permitting process, the current permitting process tied to the waters of the U.S. already presents significant challenges for counties. The proposed rule would only complicate matters. For example, one Florida, Florida county applied for 18 maintenance exemptions on the county's network of drainage and ditches and canals. The permitting process became so challenging that the county had to hire consult a consultant to complete all of the technical material required. Three months later, as the county moved into its rainy season and after $600,000 had been invested, decisions on 16 of the exemptions were still pending. Ditches began to flood, putting the public at risk, and this is just one of many examples. In conclusion, while many have attempted to paint this as a political issue, in the eyes of county governments, this is a matter of practicality and partnership. We look forward to working with you and the agencies to craft a clear and workable definition of waters of the U.S. that achieves our shared goal, our shared goal, which is to protect water quality without inhibiting the public safety and economic vitality of our communities. And I thank you all again for this opportunity to address you this afternoon. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Fox, please proceed with your five minutes when you're prepared. Thank you and good afternoon, Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Lujan Grisham and members. 
I'm Joe Fox, and by the way, honored to be here. I'm the State Forester of Arkansas, and I represent the National Association of State Foresters. We are in 50 states and eight territories in the District of Columbia. State Foresters direct programs and protection for America's private forests, two-thirds of the nation's forests, 500 million acres. We're responsible for the silviculture non-point source pollution control measures. We call them BMPs, Forestry Best Management Practices. Uh, a recent Virginia Tech study, data uh, collected in 2013, shows that 87% of our forestry BMPs are, are, are complied with, 87% compliance with our BMPs nationally. Arkansas's BMPs happen to be voluntary and, like other states, are very effective. In the uh, recent EPA National Assessment Database, of all the sources of water impairment, it lists forestry as significantly less than any of the other sources. Healthy forests mean clean air, but they also slow water runoff, allowing sediment to drop out. Healthy forests are clean water things, if you will. The new definition of the Rotus, <laughs> WOTUS rule, Waters of the U.S. rule, and terms uh, within the rule is in response to a Supreme Court ruling. We realize that. But I'm concerned that what is meant for clarity is just the opposite. The National Association of State Foresters shared our concerns with our formal comments last November. In those comments, we say uh, that Terms like all tributaries of navigable waters mean a broader and generalized reach by the agency. Uh, riparian areas and floodplains can be quite different if they're in New Mexico or Pennsylvania or Arkansas. It's difficult to generally describe water and land features that are regionally different. In South Arkansas, where I'm from, in the flatwoods, the pine and oak flatwoods of Calhoun County, six inches means a ridge. And then you go over there in the ridge and you cut those trees or you paint those trees or you, or you make that wildlife habitat. That's a ridge in South Arkansas. And it's not in other places. Regional differences require case-by-case -case solutions, not significant nexus generalities. National rules need the flexibility to do just that, to have a case-by-case -case analysis. Healthy, productive forests that are beside a road that, ha that has a ditch, which now might be classified as a tributary, do not need oversight by EPA because of a generalized, a generalized rule. In conclusion, state forestry BMPs work, and what works in Arkansas is different and what works in Pennsylvania or what works in New Mexico. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'll be happy to answer questions at the proper time. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Commissioner Mettler, <laughs> please go ahead and proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you. Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Luan Grisham, and members of the subcommittee, my name is Martha Clark Mettler, and it is my pleasure to appear before you today to provide the Association of Clean Water Administrators perspective on the proposed rule revising waters of the United States. I am here today representing the members of ACWA as the Association's president. I am currently the Deputy Assistant Commissioner of the Office of Water Quality with the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. I have been with IDEM since 1995, was named Deputy Assistant Commissioner in 2005, and have been a member of ACWA since that time. ACWA is the national nonpartisan professional organization representing state and interstate water quality control officials responsible for the implementation of surface water protection programs throughout the nation. The proposed rule raises implementation issues and questions that vary from state to state. Due to the varied opinions of the states, ACWA is unable to support or oppose the proposed rule. My statement today does not supersede or alter the perspective or input of any individual state. According to an analysis done by one stakeholder group, eight states support the rule, one state supports the rule with revisions, four states are neutral, 10 states oppose, and 22 states believe the rule should be withdrawn. 
Time spent reviewing the individual state comments will provide the subcommittee with a clear understanding of how the proposed rule will affect state programs. I will highlight some broad categories of concern. Geographic variability. Due to state-to-state -state differences in geohydrology and water-related legal authorities, as well as uncertainty as to the effects of the rule on the implementation of various sections of the Clean Water Act, Aqua finds it difficult to comment on whether the pros proposed rule is suitable for all states. For example, some states question the appropriateness of federal jurisdiction over all ephemeral streams, since some rain-dependent streams flow so infrequently, their effect on downstream waters is inconsequential. However, some Aqua members support federal jurisdiction over all ephemeral streams, either because they have identified a strong connection to downstream protection, or because relying on case-by-case -case determinations of significant nexus to downstream waters is too resource intensive. Exclusions. Aqua agrees that specific exclusions listed in the proposed rule provide increased clarity for regulators and the regulated community. Clear exclusions should help streamline permitting by reducing the number of individual jurisdictional determinations that will have to be made. However, some exclusions need clarification. For example, the agencies need to clarify in the final rule that ditches that drain upland but eventually do discharge to waters of the United States are not jurisdictional throughout the upland portion of the ditch. Additional clarity is needed throughout the rule. Aqua agrees with EPA and the Corps that clarity in Clean Water Act jurisdictional determinations is needed. However, to achieve that clarity, Aqua believes the agencies need to provide clear definitions in the final rule. For example, the proposed rule failed to provide clear bounds on the spatial extent of floodplains and riparian areas. Terms like rills, goalies, and uplands are not defined, but should be, to add the needed clarity to the final rule. Aqua also believes that the final rule must make it clear that the ability of states to assume the 404 program is not affected. Significant nexus analysis. The agencies should strive to limit the categories of waters that will require a case-by-case -case significant nexus analysis. For the, hopefully, few waters that do require a significant nexus analysis, the burden should be on EPA and the Corps to make timely determinations. Agreement and consistency between core districts and EPA is needed to afford successful implementation of the final rule. Finally, Additional guidance is necessary. Aqua feels strongly that the agencies develop a set of regional, ecologically delineated guidance for key elements of the rule, like the significant nexus determinations. However, for this guidance to be useful, states must be involved in its development. Without clear terms and guidance, states will be left to interpret the rule on their own, which will undermine national consistency, increase litigation, and perpetuate uncertainty. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Grisham, and members of the subcommittee, I thank you for this opportunity to share Aqua's perspective on the proposed Waters of the U.S. rule. I'm happy to answer any questions. Commissioner, thank you very much. Uh, we'll, get, uh, we'll now proceed with the uh, questioning part. Uh, each member will be recognized for five minutes of questioning, and, and I'll uh, exercise the opportunity to uh, ask the first five minutes of questioning to this panel. The, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection submitted comments on October 8, 2014, uh, which uh, if there's no objection, I'd like to submit for the record. Seeing none, those will be considered, will be submitted. In these comments, the agency stated, quote, the rule as drafted creates more confusion than it clarifies and is already subject to differing interpretations by the Environmental Protection Agency and Army Corps of Engineers staff. This confusion will delay permitting that could undermine strong state programs. Pennsylvania asked the EPA and the Army Corps to consider an approach that recognizes regional differences in geography, climate, geology, soils, hydrology, and rainfall, and that supports the strong and comprehensive state programs. So with this in mind, my first question for the panel this panel is, um, would you agree that with the assertion that EPA made that this uh, WOTUS rule could actually undermine uh, strong existing state efforts? Go ahead, Mr. Commissioner Smeltz. 
Yeah, thank you, Congressman Thompson, for that question, and I'd be happy to try to address that. Being that I'm from Pennsylvania and I have worked with DEP on a number of permitting issues in my career, I agree. Uh, the question I think you asked was, if you would phrase it again, it was, well, the WOTUS decision or determination, rule yeah, definition. Would it, would it undermine, undermine strong, robust state programs that are currently in place? And in the state quality. of in the state of Pennsylvania, and I have seen this this history evolve over time. In the state of Pennsylvania, the uh, the state has worked diligently, particularly with soil conservation districts, which do have authority at the local level in Pennsylvania to help process permits for uh, environmental permits of various kinds. Uh, they have worked diligently to to develop a, a a permitting process that the that the uh, counties and local jurisdictions currently fully understand in fact i would suggest that those regula regulations within the state of pennsylvania are actually more stringent uh, than some are as stringent i better say as stringent as some of the some of the uh, the federal legislation so if you're already truly regulating a environmental condition. I don't know what additional federal regulation on top of that is going to accomplish. Uh, what we're concerned about is then it will lead to more cost, more public safety risk, and more cost because the state has developed a what they call a guaranteed turnaround time for permits. And so to answer your question, if if we again add additional confusing terminology to the permitting process in a state where you already have a very thorough permitting process, then the counties that I'm dealing with, the counties that I represent across these, not just Pennsylvania, but across the United States, but in this case, Pennsylvania, you're gonna add a mixed message. You're gonna, you're gonna delay permitting processes. You're gonna add engineering fees and engineering costs uh, you may at sometimes add risk because now a project that you're trying to complete is delayed because there's additional steps that need to be taken over and above that which is already in place. And you're going to get the desired results with the existing state permit procedures that are in place. You're going to protect water, and NACO wants counties to protect water. NACO uh, encourages local jurisdictions and states to have regulatory and permitting procedures in place. So to answer your question, additional confusing terminology will in fact do what you suggest. It will make it, will make it more complicated, more costly, and not accomplish the intended results. Yeah. So, Secretary Woody, and thoughts from New Mexico's perspective, um, you know, would you see WOTUS as any way undermining the existing efforts that may be in place today? Chairman Thompson, I, I really couldn't say it any any better than uh, Mr. Smell. The confusing issue of who regulates what is has always been a problem in in states like New Mexico. And and when you we've got thousands of miles of streams that are uh, intermittent, ephemeral, uh, and and you put a regulation like what's in the proposed WOTUS regulation uh, on top of that for the for the landowners, the agencies, and even the state environment department, in, the, in our case in New Mexico, to know who's going to be in charge of those regulations is going to create a, uh, a logistical and a, and a costly system. And, and so I, I believe we're, it will cause a lot of confusion in our state. Thank you very much. Please uh, recognize the ranking member for a five minutes question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to take up just where you've left off, and uh, Secretary Witte, I really appreciate your following up on that question about whether or not uh, one of the unintended consequences would be to uh, uh, see a lessening of states' authority and responsibilities, and I use state in the broadest sense, so local governments and our private partners under the current regulatory framework would be able to manage clean water protections currently. And what you referenced, and I'm going to do it both uh, referring back to your testimony and your comment just now, is that water jurisdiction, water management, 
water quality and clean water protections are very complex. And in fact, today we know that we have several communities that in fact don't have safe drinking water issues. So the status quo in the current system, one can argue is problematic and that we need to do something moving forward because there are jurisdictional questions and issues in the current context that are not working. Would you agree? Uh, yes, Ranking Member Lujan Grisham, I would uh, absolutely agree that uh, it's a challenge in today's environment, uh, even without the, the voters' rule. And I really appreciate that because, and that's not to minimize that you identified significant issues with the current proposed rule, but that getting to a place where all of the stakeholders are clarifying responsibilities and opportunities so that ultimately we protect our water you know, is really important. And one of the other issues that you identified is that uh, arroyos, and we have another thing called acequias in the southwest, primarily New Mexico. One is naturally occurring arroyos, which are often uh, sort of monsoon and, and are natural geography related. It's dry, then it's really wet, it's dry, really wet. So we have these uh, incredible uh, erosions that uh, water will flow through and then we make some of those ourselves, and those are acequias so that we can manage as water management and irrigation system opportunity. These are not defined uh, by the uh, proposed rule and it's an example of, it's a small example but an important example to a rural state like New Mexico about the inability for EPA in the current context to really understand some of the issues that we have to deal with and the complexities of the jurisdiction. I was struck by uh, several of the panelists talking about the withdrawal of the rule. And, and I'm wondering, uh, as we look at methods going forward, you know, we could also ask EPA to do a supplemental rule because they have significant comments that, frankly, I think they ought to address and they ought to re-engage their stakeholders using, in fact, the Arroyo as an example, that they are not quite prepared to move forward and a supplemental rule would give my stakeholders and yours a much quicker opportunity to weigh in from that baseline. What do you think about that? Uh, Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Lujan Grisham, I, I couldn't agree more. The, uh, the opportunities that EPA has really to bring people, you had over a million people comment on this proposed rule. and, and while we call for the withdrawal of the rule, we know that waters, the, the waters of the U.S. has to be addressed in some form and fashion. As a regulator in my state, I know that regulations were created for a purpose, and over time they evolve, either through other decisions or court cases or whatever. And, and every now and then as an agency, we have to take a step back and look at the real pr true purpose. Every comment that I reviewed in preparing for this hearing said virtually the same thing. Withdraw repropose, collaborate with the local groups from the ground up. EPA has an unprecedented opportunity to bring people together and really consider there are some dynamite, fantastic comments that EPA could use to make a rule that works. It doesn't fit. One size doesn't fit all, as was pointed out on, on this panel. One, you know, we in New Mexico are unique, just as the folks in Pennsylvania and Arkansas and, and all across this nation. and, and uh, you really have to take that local input. I think it's important. And they have an opportunity to, to bring it back together and, and get something that works. They propose a rule that doesn't address a lot of these issues. It's just going to be as confusing as it is today. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I appreciate you. I'm, I'm really out of time for the rest of the panel. Thank you for being here today. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. General Lee yields back. I thank her. And we now recognize uh, the, uh, the gentleman from... Uh, Tennessee, Mr. Desjardins, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to our panel. Uh, we have an awful lot of issues that uh, we face here in Congress, whether it's a health care law, whether it's the threat of ISIS, uh, or the, the deficit, any number of issues. But I, I can tell you that uh, this uh, Waters of the U.S. rule has really grabbed the attention of a lot of people. And I, would, I know it's not Tennessee-centric because I have contacts from around the country, whether it's California, South Dakota, Colorado, calling me saying you've got to stop this rule. So I'm very grateful that uh, we're having this hearing today. Uh, I want to kind of look at it from an oversight perspective a little bit today in terms of how so many agencies are taking steps to circumvent the rule review process. And uh, specifically, I'd look to, like to look at it economically in terms of how uh, the uh, 
uh, OIRA and uh, EPA have uh, tried to circumvent this rule. On March the 3rd, uh, Mr. Howard Shalansky, the administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, or ORIRA, or IRA, easy for me to say, right, testified before the House Oversight and Government Reform Subcommittee on Administrative Rules. And uh, this, of course, is the office responsible for reviewing the legality and economic impact of a new federal rule before they are published and ultimately accepting or rejecting the proposed rule. Uh, it, it, was, it was troubling to me that uh, when we asked Mr. Shalansky whether or not he could present to our committee the documents uh, that they used to make a ruling that uh, this was non-major or uh, economically non-significant. We know the cutoff for that is $100 million per year. So what I'm going to ask of you all later and possibly the second panel, panel is that we talk about that $100 million per year cost. Uh, you know, somehow, after reviewing the waters of the U.S. rule, uh, OIRA determined that it was not a significant rule, rule and therefore not subject to congressional review despite estimates of annual costs ranging from 160 to 278 million per year, and some of these estimates coming from Army Corps engineers and EPA. And uh, what was also concerning was that uh, the, the lack of documentation uh, that uh, Mr. Shalansky uh, was unable to provide, because it wasn't just the Tennessee Farm Bureau, which is the largest in the nation, who was here asking questions, or farmers from all around our district, the NFIB, or National Federation of Independent Businesses, sent a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request, to the EPA, and also Small Business uh, Office of Ad Advocacy sent letters asking for documentation on how they came about this rule, and the EPA sent a letter back saying they have no documentation. So I guess what I'd like to accomplish today is that next time we have Mr. Shalansky or the EPA in front of one of our committees, we can give them documentation that this rule is indeed going to cost more than $100 million. So I don't know if anyone on the panel came prepared with uh, numbers. But uh, Mr. Smeltz, do you have any idea from what you've been hearing from your folks back home what the economic impact might be? Well, I, I do. I don't know how, what broad spectrum of, of jurisdiction this $100 million figure is, is you're speaking of. You're talking about across the state? Across the nation. Across the nation. Okay, well, I, it'd be hard for me to address that from that perspective. I, I can only tell you, uh, while I don't have any raw numbers, I do have raw, I, I can get no raw numbers, and we have done this analysis at times. I can tell you that the imposition of, of, of any delays, for example, I know, I'll give you an example. There was a project in, in our area in Pennsylvania where, a, uh, where an amendment had to be made, where an amendment had to be made to a, a uh, 20, I think it was $27 million road project. Now this, this road project had, there was a change in the environmental design. There was a change in the ditch pattern that they were going to use to build it. There was a bridge and an interchange. I think it was worth $27 million. Okay. Mr. Smeltz, if you could, just because I've only got about 24 seconds okay, left, I mean, is any, does anyone else on the panel have an estimate yeah. or an opinion as to whether or not they are hearing that this would have an economic impact of more than $100 million per year? Okay, if anyone can get that, perhaps a second panel, I think that'd be useful information to make sure we get to the EPA and we get to OIRA when they're trying to make a determination on this rule. And thank you for your time. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Uh, thank the gentleman. Uh, just as uh, uh, just so everyone's aware, our votes will be pending here, perhaps uh, what any time. <laughs> Have they started already? I think so. Okay, so we'll continue here with questioning as to see how far we can get until we, want to make, we do want to make sure members get to the floor in time to, to uh, cast their votes. So uh, please recognize from Washington State, uh, uh, Ms. Delbane for five minutes.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to thank all of you for being here with us today. Um, this is an important issue. I've heard about it from farmers throughout my district. And also on the other side, we had over 17,000 Washingtonians who sent in comments in support of the rule. So it's definitely a very relevant issue in in our region. Um, Ms. Mettler, I wanted, to, in order to make sure that everyone is kind of operating with the same information, I wondered if you could walk us through the differences in section 402 and 404 permits, kind of the activities they cover, and the special case for pesticides. Sure, um, for section 402, that is generally um, wastewater discharges either from municipal or industrial dischargers, and most states have a broad definition of waters of the state that they use to implement that program if it's been delegated delegated to their state, which most states have, but not all. And so those kind of permits uh, regulate the discharges into pipe from those facilities and would dis, uh, regulate a number of uh, regulated contaminants uh, that we would want to keep under the water quality standards. Um, Section 401 is a water quality certification that any fill, discharge of fill material, would be meeting our water quality standards. And that is a companion document to the Army Corps' uh, 404 permit. Um, so you do have to work in conjunction with the Corps to make sure that uh, you get all your permits. And that was one of the uh, things that was mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, the pesticide general permit um, was, as mentioned, kind of added as a concern due to a court ruling uh, to maintain permits for applications of pesticides uh, on or near water. And that is a general permit, so most states developed a uh, broad set of uh, requirements that if you satisfy those in your applications of permits, um, you send in a notice of intent and you're covered by that permit. Uh, with that, you're under FIFRA regulations as well to apply according to the label. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Um, you also said in your testimony that, and I think everyone mentioned this, that many parts of the rule need additional clarification. And um, that's definitely something I've heard from all of our farmers as well. Uh, you know, I ran a state agency. I understand rules are not always um, applied how they were intended and that they aren't always perfect. Um, given that, are there adequate clarifications that if we're, they were made to a final rule where you could see the rule as a benefit for the community and from your perspective as a regulator? Well, I think that if you go back in the history that the agencies first attempted guidance, I won't be able to give you the date, but a few years back, and that was uh, not sufficient for most states that are trying to maintain regulatory certainty because they're trying to follow the federal rule and the implementation of their state rules. So uh, there's different ways, as, um, as the ranking member kind of mentioned, of getting to that regulatory certainty in this rule. And I think that states would be open to different ways as long as you ended up in that place where you did have a clear understanding of the meeting. And again, uh, to really get there, you do need to collaborate with the uh, regulated community as well as your state co-regulators, and that, that's important. Um, you actually brought up a concern that we've heard from folks about the proposed rule not having engagement with state and local officials. Were any of you involved um, or contacted, asked for feedback? Prior to the proposal, no. No, no. no. And thank you. Um, you know, each region of the country also faces unique issues with water. I think you brought this up in terms of Arkansas. Um, in the Northwest, uh, we have a lot of water, but not always necessarily in the right place at the right time. Um, and a, you know, a concern I've heard repeatedly is that working farmland is at risk. In addition, many of our farmers have brought up the interface between water quality and quantity specifically related, at, and you talked about this earlier, specifically related to new upland areas within the Clean Water Act jurisdiction where water's withdrawn for irrigation or other uses. Um, there's now a potential link to the Clean Water Act and thus some farmers are worried about a prohibition on withdrawals or against future allocation of waters. 
Um, I just, this was a general question for everyone. I guess I don't have enough time left to get all your answers, but I wondered if you could comment on this concern from your perspectives or if you're able to um, send us feedback on that another time, since I'm running out of time. Generally, time's expired, but uh, I, I think the, that information certainly would be appreciated if we could uh, put that in writing and follow up to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, please recognize the uh, gentleman from Michigan, Dr. Benchak, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to also thank the panel for being here. I, I, I truly appreciate you coming to Washington to talk to us. Uh, I represent northern Michigan, and uh, Michigan has over 20 million acres of forest land, which represents over half the land mass of the state. And of that, uh, over 12 million acres is privately owned. And uh, our foresters and timber managers are working hard to keep the forest properly managed. And um, I'm concerned about the cost and burden of additional forest federal regulations that would prove detrimental to a, a struggling industry in my state. Uh, Mr. Fox, what are you hearing from foresters in your area about the proposed rule and how it will impact the forest industry in your state? Well, in general, they're uh, fairly worried about the possibilities of the stretch of our long-standing forest road ditches that are connected to something. Are, are they going to be jurisdictional uh, with EPA and the Corps of Engineers? There's, there's talk of closing roads. There's talk of, of uh, closing certain private lands. There's, there's worries over uh, if I'm in the business of, of producing timber, uh, will I be able to get the timber to the mill? So those worries uh, actually depreciate the value of the trees and the land they're on. So what, what effect do you think the proposed rule will have on forest health, uh, Mr. Fox? Well, the healthy forests are those forests that are thinned, and in Arkansas, uh, uh, thinned underneath as well as thinned from above. And if if we can't get our if we can't get skitters and feller bunchers and forwarders on the ground or over the roads, the trucks to the mills. Uh, that's a that's a real big problem. So I think the effect uh, is the uncertainty of can we can we produce from these acres, and that uncertainty again lo uh, leads to uh, sometimes conversion to other uses rather than forests, which would be the worst thing that can happen for our forests, or sometimes it leads to devaluation of the of the land and timber. Let me, let me ask you another question. If the rule goes through as proposed, does the infrastructure currently exist to um, help both private landowners and other foresters remain in compliance? What issues do you see them facing? Arkansas is a non-regulatory state, so the infra infrastructure does not exist uh, to do that. We would have to build our state forestry commission personnel to help landowners or contract with consultants. The, uh, the infrastructure is not in place in my state to deal with it. Mr. Smeltz, do you, do you have any opinion on that? Do you have to deal with these issues as a, in your county? Well, not, not specific with forest, perhaps, but we are a largely forested county and where I'm from in, in Clinton County, but, but county governments are responsible for the maintenance of of uh, a vast majority of the nation's uh, rural highway system when you leave the non-interstate systems. So that the, uh, the, main, the, the, the key to maintaining an infrastructure system is, is of course drainage, or proper drainage. And if the uh, abilities to maintain, because of the, the uh, ambiguity in some of the terminology and, and additional permits being required, and knowing what to do it, it where the counties to maintain highway systems and road systems where the rubber meets the road, if there's confusion in that arena, uh, it, it's, going, it, it's going to lead to it, failures in your infrastructure if, you don't, if you're not able to maintain ditches and maybe be able to clean ditches. So, so we certainly don't want a rule interpretation that hinders that process at the county level. And, and so, uh, yeah, that, that's it's, a great concern. Uh, Secretary uh, Witte, um, let me ask you a question. 
similar to that. Do you think that uh, this regulation adds more clarity to the, the plan of managing uh, the waters of the U.S.? Mr. Chairman, Congressman Benichek, absolutely not. As is currently stated and proposed, it does not add clarity. It actually adds confusion. My concern would be, is the attitude of the agency going to be regulatory enforcement or compliance assistance? And typically it's been in the past regulatory enforcement. And that's the thing you've got to watch out with if you've got unclear rules and regulations. Thank you very much. Good. Gentleman's time expired. Uh, Chair, just for everybody, they have called votes, but I think we're going to be able to get through uh, the members that are present for questions, so should you choose to uh, stay. Uh, and then we will resume um, uh, 10 minutes after the, um, when the last call vote is, is announced. So I encourage you to vote right away, and please come on back. Uh, so please recognize the gentlelady from Arizona, Mr. Kirkpatrick, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member, uh, for having this important hearing. Uh, this is a big issue for my huge uh, Arizona Congressional District. In fact, uh, with all due respect to you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Smeltz, my Congressional District is bigger than the entire state of Pennsylvania, and it's covered in forests. So we've recently had some horrific and fatal forest fires. In fact, my neighbors in New Mexico may have experienced some of the smoke from those fires. So Secretary Witte, my question is for you, and actually I have three, so in the interest of time I'm going to ask the three questions at one time and then you can answer, answer them. Uh, in your testimony you said that uh, the proposed rule would make fire prevention, uh, fire management, and rehabilitation more difficult. So my first question is what specifically uh, in the proposed rule would do that, would make fire prevention more difficult? Uh, my second question is, will the proposed rule require any new or different permitting? And then what is your suggestion uh, to changes in the rule that would allow us to, to continue our forest practices uninterrupted? Mr. Chairman, Representative, or uh, <coughs> Congresswoman Kirkpatrick. It's my belief that if you look at the rule and the, and the potential because of the unclear definitions of arroyos and ditches and things like that, uh, gullies, that if, if we in fact have regulatory creep into other areas that weren't historically uh, regulated, you could increase permitting. And if you're going to go in and do, and we in New Mexico and probably in Arizona, it's a lot the same. We wish we had a forest industries. We've got mismanaged, overgrown forests uh, that are causing these catastrophic wildfires. And, and we've got to get in there. And, and right now, the Forest Service is hampered because of, of issues, but they've got to do their environmental assessments, their environmental impact statements, and things like that. If you add this on top of that, there's one more permit and one more step they've got to go through before we can actually manage the forest properly to, to avoid these catastrophic wildfires. So I think that's the critical point of confusion that we've got to address and clarify in, in forest management. In other words, we need to streamline the process for clearing the acreage that can be uh, logged and rather than increasing that regulation process. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Rep uh, Congresswoman Kirkpatrick, exactly. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to yield back, uh, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady and please recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Bose, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I'm going to ask a fairly simple question real quick because we are kind of pressed for time to get across the street, but, and, and anybody on the panel, if you can, whether the agency is expand, if they expand these definition, or we just stop them from expanding the definition, do you think your local governments are in the position to make sensible, improve, sensible law uh, to take the control that is necessary? I mean, I come from state government, and I know how I feel about that, but I'd like to hear your comments on those. My comment from Arkansas would be that, that we, we have uh, little regulation in this area for forests. We're a very collaborative state. We're working together with groups like the Nature Conservancy, the Arkansas Timber Producers Association, the Arkansas Forestry Association, Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, and we train loggers and foresters and landowners, forest landowners, how to treat their roads, their stream crossings, their harvesting units, 
and it's all done on a voluntary basis and it's working rather well. Our compliance rate in Arkansas is 87% overall and 90% on those in my mind that really mean something and that's like stream crossings. Uh, it's, it's a big deal to us to regulate ourselves but on a voluntary basis and that's what I like. Thank you, Congressman, for that question. Uh, I would say that the co a collaborative effort is what is desired by NACO. And that collaborative effort, it varies from, we're hearing it varies from state to state as far as the, as you're saying, Illinois, the regulatory processes within each state. But for those who, if I may say, the boots on the ground folks at the county level, those who are responsible for maintaining infrastructure, who have to deal with the consequences of this regulatory, they're the ones you really need to consult with. But I, I would say that I can, I can speak to Pennsylvania that the collaborative effort between the soil conservation districts, the county, county governments, the state governments have, have produced the results that I believe this rule is trying to accomplish. There may be areas where, where it does need to be tightened, perhaps in other parts of the country, but please, I, I, we're asked that, that that collaborative approach be used and please consult with the people who do the work and they will tell you and they will help you try to get what you're trying to accomplish. And therefore, that's why we ask for the rule to be withdrawn and start all over with a more uh, complete process where all the facts are considered. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Thompson, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Congressman Yost, host, the states have the capacity to deal with at, at a certain level, but all the states are, are as I was visiting with our environment department secretary earlier today about this, you know, you know, his point was that even today states are struggling with their budgets and if you add one more thing onto the state requirement, uh, they're not sure they can handle it without further, you know, uh, resources from EPA or whoever's requiring it. Because of the budget stress, though, it causes collaboration. And, and as Mr. Smeltz added, the, the Environment Department works with our agency, the State Department of Agriculture, Soil and Water Conservation Districts, and others to, to collaborate and, and find the best opportunities to work together to address the water quality needs in the state of New Mexico. And that's including EPA at this point in time. I guess I would simply say that, uh, as mentioned before, the beauty of the Clean Water Act is it delegates uh, certain authorities to the states, and the states are um, pretty dedicated to protecting their waters and prioritizing uh, based on what they think is important within their own regulatory frameworks. And so uh, to have that flexibility to prioritize based on their own landscape is important. Thank, thank you all for your answers. I'm from state government uh, is where I came originally, and um, I kind of agree with all of you that you know this is kind of an overreach. So hopefully we can move forward in, a, in the right direction. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, gentleman yields back. Please recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Allen, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, obviously hearing lots about uh, this issue. And uh, it sounds like that uh, EPA has made some determination here that we, we have a serious problem. And what kind of, what are they using as evidence that would create all of this discussion? I mean, are, are we, are we uh, not taking care of our streams and tributaries and like we should be? I mean, what, what, what exactly are they up to here? Uh, Mr. Fox, uh, I'd like to know your viewpoint on that. Well, if, if I'm able to give my opinion, I, I think they're responding to two things. And one is a Supreme Court decision, the Rapanos decision, and, and secondly, to budget cuts. Uh, EPA's suffered several budget cuts over the last several years. They have less capacity to do site-by-site uh, -site, uh, jurisdictional um, uh, investigations, and they don't have enough people to do what the way they've done business before, 
And frankly, I see this as a generalized effort to streamline their work so that they can, so that they can get their work done. I think there, you know, it, takes a, it takes a year to get a, a ruling on a jurisdiction. Yeah. Mr. Smeltz, would you have an opinion on that? Yes, I'm not sure what the EPA is trying to do. I, 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 would, I would tell you this, sir, um, that counties, counties across the United States, it's to our, it's to our advantage for purposes of, of agriculture, tourism, uh, recreation. We want clean water. You don't need to teach us at the county level that we want to. We want to do that because we, I like Mr. Fox's comment, the collaborative would we do it to the degree without any regular? I don't know, but we know the importance. The, the other thing is, uh, I, would, I would suggest that, it, that they're creating them, not to dispute Mr. Fox's comments, it was interesting, they may be creating themselves more work by, yeah. uh, so I That's what I'm if, thinking. He, yeah, if they already uh, are short staffed, they're going to create more work yeah. for the counties. Counties, and states, we'll, yeah. everybody is going to be uh, in Everybody, and we're going to have to hire more engineers, and we're going to perhaps hire more attorneys mm -hmm. to resolve these issues, and we certainly don't want to do that. No offense to any attorneys in the room. Uh, but we don't want to spend our money that way. We want to spend our money in building infrastructure, not in sorting out confusing roles. So I... I, I, I Perhaps I scratched my head in response to your yeah, question. Exactly. And, Thank uh, you, sir. Uh, Mr. Secretary, any comment in that regard? Chairman Thompson, Congressman Allen, I have no idea what EPA was thinking. When, when you're under a, a, the kind of budget situation that we meet with our Region 6, and they, they talk about their, their uh, tightness of resources all the time, and when you come out with a rule like this, it's going to require more. Sometimes it's better off if they would take a step back and you know try to figure out something that makes more common sense and and really hit the ground with something that'll work. And and uh, uh, yes, Ms. Miller, would you have a comment as well? Well, I just was going to mention that uh, the current rule does lead to some regulatory uncertainty, yeah. and if you believe EPA. Uh, in their description of what they were trying to accomplish was additional clarity. It covers uh, everything, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, a hole in the ground. Pretty so much. Some, some states have, have struggled with current, yeah. current wording to try and get those jurisdictional determinations. So if you could get clarity, that would be good. Right. And, you know, I'm, what bothers me is that they just don't seem to uh, want to know what you're thinking. I mean, okay, how do we solve whatever problem we have here? And so they create all this uncertainty, and every, everyone's up in arms about it because you're talking about a lot of money here that could be spent. That uh, folks, you know, things are tight everywhere, and uh, folks are, uh, it's tough. It's tough out there. I mean, the timber business is, is tough right now, and, uh, and it's wet everywhere, <laughs> at least in my district. So it's hard to get the timber out of there. But, uh, but thank you so much for being here today, and I appreciate your, uh, your expertise. And, We'll do everything we can for you. Gentlemen, goes back. Appreciate it. Thank you to the first panel for your expertise and your testimony. Greatly appreciated. As uh, announced before, there is a series of votes have been called and in process. I anticipate this series of votes to last approximately until 3.55, uh, and members uh, will return to the hearing as quickly as possible following the vote. Uh, this hearing will stand in recess subject to the call of the chair.